Alrighty. Um, now, first time using this new lens on my camera, and I gotta say, I'm getting a whole lot more, more of everything, and the camera is a hell of a lot closer. <laughs> we have our fretboard that has been tapered, and we're pretty much good to go ahead and cut the frets. Now what I'm gonna do is mark out the fret positions and then we'll go from there. This is a process that if you're familiar to the channel, you have seen me do many, many times before, but for those of you who are probably new to this, uh, this is a book that you must get if you want to do guitar building. Melvin Hiscox, uh, Make Your Own Electric Guitar. This book is amazing, not only for all the content in it where he builds a bunch of different instruments. The back of the guitar has these tables which have all your fret positions for a bunch of the most common scale lengths that you'll have for guitars and for bass. For this one in particular, we're gonna go for 24.75, so the Gibson scale length, 24 and three quarters as some might know it. Must be said already, as I mentioned, Melvin Hescock, rest in peace as he did pass away if I remember correctly, last year. Fantastic guy for making a bunch of guitar building books and yeah. Anywho, 24 and three quarters is what we're gonna go for. And the tools that we will need for this is of course the fretboard, a really good ruler. I would recommend a steel ruler that is as accurate as possible. Don't, don't skimp out on buying your measuring devices. If you pay good money for a good set of these, you're, you're set for a long time and take good care of them. At least a 60 centimeter or what, 24 inch ruler will be good. A protractor, I love to use the Incra Rules protractor because this is, this is amazing and well worth the money. I need to buy another one of these because it is fairly bent. Scalpel, doesn't hurt to have a little bit more thicker of a blade, we'll get to that. A really good mechanical pencil, masking tape, super glue, not, I mean, the super glue and accelerator and template thing, those are just to kind of give me a little bit more lift on the fretboard when I'm cutting. And of course, a fret slotting saw. Now I do have a jig to cut fret slots, but that is for a 25 inch and a 25 and a half inch scale length. So I need to do this by hand, which will be fun to show everybody. So get yourself a very good, Fretting saw, and let's get started. So to get started, of course, we have a center line, and I'm just gonna put this ruler right alongside it so that I can easily mark out the positions. Now, be sure to tape your ruler down so it doesn't accidentally move. Change your measurements halfway through. I usually put one piece of tape on either end of the fretboard. The first position for a 24.75 from the nut is 35.284. Now, of course, there's no way that we're gonna get that close, but we can get close enough for sure if we're just trying to be as accurate as possible. So 34.28, so that leans more toward 34.3, sorry, 35.3, 35 there. And 68, so that's a little bit over five. One, two, nine point six nine. Now, what you wanna do is you're just gonna mark out your frets. And then once we've drawn them on, on the fretboard, and we're gonna go and use a scalpel, a fresh scalpel blade, uh, we're gonna try and score those pencil lines directly in the middle of the pencil line. So I'm gonna do the rest, come back in a bit. Now, if there's a part of you that feels that you're not getting it accurate enough or you're not sure whether you're getting it accurate enough, you can use a digital caliper if you have one with a few of the first, one that, first ones that you're gonna do. So the first one that we had was 35.28. 35.28, so that's there. And right on the money. Let's see, we can get inches probably a little bit closer. So Imperial, that will be 1.389, 1.389. And right there, right on the money. All right, cool. Uh, let's do 
68.587. Yeah, there we are. Once you've done, done everything once, go back, recheck everything, just to make sure that you're correct, and then only move on to the next phase. Now that we have all the fret positions marked, we're gonna use the protractor along with the center line marked out previously, get our line like so. Now that is the line that we're then gonna follow in order to get the first slot put in. So I'm just gonna show you what that's like real quick. I'll line up my protractor so that it is according to the center line and enough so that the blade of the scalpel will be hitting the middle of the pencil line that I just drew. And then, then I just need to score the wood a few times with the scalpel to get my line. Now, in order for us to actually get the saw to follow that line a bit better, I'm gonna be using another blade that has a little bit thicker of a blade to it to just reinforce that. Now you could use the, and when you're doing this for the first time, I do recommend that you use a guide, but if you've done it, if you've scored the wood enough, you should be able to just follow the line that you have scored. As long as you don't press too hard and you don't go too quick, and you have as many digits on your working surface as possible, you'll be able to follow that line fairly well. All right. Try not to waver with uh, when it comes to hitting grains and stuff like that. But if you do, and if you get a scratch in the fretboard, doesn't mean that everything's ruined because we haven't radius the fretboard yet. This is also one of the reasons why I don't radius yet. I mean, there's multiple ways of looking at it. You could radius the fretboard first and then you can easily get a nice curve into the fret slot so that you do know that you're getting an even depth all across, which is definitely a very good way to go. But it's just a matter of personal preference, really. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. There's nothing wrong with doing it this way. This way is just more if something happens, if some sort of mistake or blade goes somewhere, then you're not left with a scratch on the fretboard because you're gonna sand it away anyways. Instead of having radiused everything, putting a scratch into it, and then having to radius again, which would be a pain. So, I'm just gonna leave it as is, and I'm gonna continue marking out all the rest of the frets, and yeah, probably using the scalpel while we go. Oh, there we go. That is the fret slots marked out and we're good to cut. So what I'm gonna do is just because it's very hard for me to cut something on such a flat surface, well, not flat, but cutting like this, well, I find it a bit more difficult. So I usually put my fretboard up a little higher so I can afford to go a little angular to get those cuts started. So, in order to do that, I'm just gonna use the good old masking tape and super glue trick. Glue to hold it steady. A little bit of activator. Great. Good to cut, except I want to actually hold it in place to my, uh, well, I want to hold it a bit better. Now we're good to cut. Um, let's get a little bit of masking tape on here, and this will give us the depth of the cut. That is the only purpose of this masking tape on the saw 
is just to give us an accurate depth all the way through. Cutting the fret slots with a fretting saw. Now this is the PAX fretting saw and I gotta say, I love this saw. It's so great. You can get, a, get it from multiple places. I got mine from TLC Guitar Goods. I believe my old one was a hand-me-down, just a PAX. But I can't remember where, in England anyway, but I can't remember where I got it from. Um, hand-me-down and it, it's really, really dull. Now I use it for other things. So I got myself a nice new sharp one, which should make quick work of cutting these fret slots. Now, what you wanna do is open up. Oh, that clamp is not on. Yeah, you wanna open up the slot from both sides. Now, the PAX fretting saw is a pull cut. So I'm just following the line that I have scored earlier. I'm trying not to twist the blade at all as I'm cutting because that will make the ends go all wonky, which will be problematic when you're putting frets in because it might end up with having fret pop. So, using my finger here as a guide, which also helps me keep the blade a little bit more squared, and then going at it slowly but surely. You can get, uh, I believe like a old file or something, you could put it on here to kind of help keep you uh, squared away, but I'll also just practice makes perfect. Not saying that my sawing skills are perfect, but they are the result of a lot of practice. Now we've evenly taken that down to the masking tape there, which you can kind of see, and we're gonna move on to the others. up. Should probably clean up a little bit. That's just easy because I can just do this. Voila. Um. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We share this work desk so I better not get any excess dirt or glue or stuff on it. So I'm trying to keep it clean. Da -da. Better than the previous version for sure the white top on it. Oh shit, okay, didn't exactly work. I'll vacuum later. So, we have now slotted the fretboard. At this point, the thing that I was gonna do next was just take this off here, glue on the binding, and then move on and glue on the wings to the headstock. We're gonna glue on the wings to the headstock, sure, but I realized that I've been trying to figure out inlay ideas for God knows how long for this guitar. Originally, they were supposed to be the, you know, traditional Gibson block inlays. But what's the point? Because that's not, this is a 10th anniversary build. I'm supposed to show what I know and how, how I do things and show how I've improved. And if you might recall, the guitar that this is based on has the first inlay job that I ever did. It's A, atrocious. And this should be something akin to that, except, you know, better. But I don't want to do the same inlays. First of which is because I don't want my name or, you know, Tomster <laughs> written on the fretboard or a yin yang sign. Yin yang's fine if it has a purpose. The reason why I did the yin yang was because I was, well, I don't know. I thought it was cool. It's nothing else to it. But I want to do something. I want to do something else to this. I like the idea of having two different materials. So I might do a big 12th fret inlay with two materials around it. but. I need to start thinking about what to use for that. I could use the birch that I've already used 
plentifully through this build. And I could definitely use some Pearl, which I have some for this build as well. So I'm gonna get the ideas rolling, but while I do so, I might as well glue the headstock wings onto the neck blank we have here. So to do that, I need to get that surface nicely planed, planed up uh, to get myself a nice gluing surface for this plane surface and the same thing on the other side. Let's tackle that. I did a little bit of sharpening on my block plane. Hopefully this will do the trick. If not, we'll see. I have a whetstone, finally. Um, <laughs> once again, from my grandfather's um, shed. There is one problem with it though. I believe, whoa, it is <laughs> severely banana shape in shape. Um, so I should take this to uh, diamond stone, flatten it out, probably at the workshop because they have one. But it worked fine now. I sharpened up all the chisels for the engraving or the chip carving work that we're gonna do. So yeah, anywho, moving on. All right, um, to say the least that I'm not expecting this to go well, especially because, well, this plane blade this blade should have uh, gotten some more um, help. <laughs> um, for those interested, this is my grandfather's very, very old wooden block plane. Seen a lot of use over the years. Um, the base of it is flat, has a nick in it, but it's flat in all the places that it needs to be. It's a pretty good condition. I could drive those nails in a bit better. The blade is Excellent, and it is a Eric Ant Eric Anton Berry uh, Swedish Garant Garanti uh, blade. Old stuff, but works phenomenally. Now the thing here that works as my detriment is the fact that my my desk is not the most stable work surface for something like this. And I fear for the life of my micro terror and it's gonna fly off into the sunset during this. But, however, um, the little bit of work that I am able to get into this, it's actually doing, cutting very nicely. And it's not great. How far are we off? Whoa, whoa, yeah, that's, Really not, not really great, um, yeah. Um, I'm just gonna use a good router bit to do this because my tools are not sharp enough, clearly, and my work surface is not stable enough for me to get the result I want. Oh, it's gonna delay this ever so slightly, gluing these on, but I'd rather do it right instead of not right. So let's, clean up and design in Italy? Sounds about right, right? And a real quick note, um, yeah. This, <clears throat> this shows the quality of the clamps that I have. It, it, um, yeah, it came loose during work. This is what happens most of the time with these clamps, and I don't have better ones. I probably should get some. Seeing as all the carving and everything else that we're gonna be putting into the body is sort of this like biomech -y type thing. Of course, I'm looking at biomech inspiration on Google. And no surprise to me that, don't need to scroll too far up until we get Devin Townsend's Ocean Machine, Biomech, which is an incredible album, which also gives me ideas as to what I might want to do. Now I had already thought about doing something like having the same sort of cutaway, make it look like a cutaway into the fretboard and then gears and cogs and stuff like that. But now, maybe I want to do something akin to taking inspiration from Ocean Machine. Also the logo of Ocean Machine is really freaking cool. Maybe I could hide that in there somehow. Just a really small detail, maybe on one of the cogs or something like that.
All right, basically, I almost listened to the entire Ocean Machine record all the way through to use as inspiration. And you saw me do a little bit of Photoshop. And we're gonna disregard everything that I did because that's, it's a very small area, uh, way too complicated. Then I realized that I had these sort of gears made out of brass. Um, these are old bits and bobs that I got from miniatures back when I did a lot of 40K Warhammer. And uh, yeah, I think I'm just gonna use just a piece of abalone and then maybe this piece of, of pearl and then use these pieces as sort of way to draw. Well, I could just draw the cracks, it's fine. But do I wanna have sort of contrast between the two? It would be pretty cool though. Then it would be a sort of yin yang, maybe. I just do that, I got like that, and then sort of thing. How's that gonna pull through together on the entire build, I don't know. But maybe, maybe less is more. Yeah, we'll cut the pearl like this, and then we'll make a sort of 12th fret block out of it. Out of all the gears and whatnot, you know, the body has a lot of detail going on on it. Putting in too much on the neck will just, it won't look too good. So I'm just gonna tone it down, less is more, and yeah, this is what we're gonna go with. All right, seeing as our inlay idea took many different permutations and finally settled on this version of it, what we are going to do next is what we were originally going to do next, which is put on the binding. It's gonna be pretty straight and simple. All it requires is glue, masking tape, and uh, yeah, not much else to it. Let's just get to it. Now, this is an operation that you've probably seen me do quite a few times. It's just as simple as putting on some glue. Now, I really don't wanna put on too much because I don't want it going into the fret slots themselves, and because we're pretty much just applying this with masking tape, or the pressure of masking tape, we don't even need that much. Now the reason why I am doing it now is because, well, first off, it makes things a lot easier when I'm doing radiusing to have the fret or the binding done already and on the board, so I don't need to do it twice because trimming down binding after the fact is kind of annoying. Now I have the plain side that I'm gonna put up against here. Give it a bit of a rub. And also, because I stopped explaining halfway through. And also the reason why I'm doing it now is just so that once the fretboard is bound up and still flat, I can easily apply that to the neck. Whereas if I would radius the neck, uh, the fretboard already at this point, it might be a bit more difficult to glue down onto the neck because, well, I don't have a flat surface to put a clamping call on. I have a curved surface. So, little things. All right, so what I'm doing is applying masking tape and then just using the force of the masking tape to kind of pull the binding onto the fretboard. And honestly, this is just about all the strength you'll need. Don't need any clamps or anything like that. Masking tape does the trick. And it's not a part that will get any massive amount of strain. And let's be real, we're gluing on like a mill and a half worth of material. Leaving it long on both ends, that I'm gonna chop off. And this end, I'm only gonna chop off once I've done the tailpiece. Now granted, <laughs> I should have probably done that first, trimmed it down, and then put the side binding, but I haven't decided whether I want to do um, just like a square joint or whether I want to, there, what is the name of that? God, I'm forgetting it now. Miter joint, all right, looks good. There's a even amount of glue coming through. So let's, one more there. Just cover my bases here. Better safe than sorry. That binding ain't gonna move nowhere. Let's get this end piece cut here. Now it needs to be a bit longer, so I'm gonna do it like this. Now do I try and do some nice, nice joinery goodness here? Let's join it up nicely. I made that too small. 
So I need to do that again. Perhaps this will be a good way of doing it. There we go, all right. Now I'm gonna need a chisel that I have just sharpened. Yeah, that looks nice. All right, cool. Um, I need this first off to be like so. Great. Is the part where I urge you to be very, very careful. Didn't quite get it all the way through. Slightly, slightly not straight. There, I think that's a bit better. Pairing away a little bit at a time. Nice, very nice. Now let's repeat that same action over here. And there we go. Great, that looks great. I'll just show you what I've accomplished here, uh, which still actually needs a little bit more work, just ever so slightly. There, all right. So that's what we managed to do. And now I'm just gonna glue it up using the exact same method as before. So masking tape and glue, that's about it. Man, that was a whole lot easier now that I had a very sharp chisel. <laughs> funny how, funny that. <laughs>